डॉक्टर शशि थरूर जी Sir, I join my colleagues in deploring the absence of the Honourable Finance Minister. No, she is not absent. Who had actually introduced the interim budget She's last week. She is coming. Already it has been. But I will nonetheless initiate uh, the debate on behalf of my party. The budget comes at a very crucial moment for our country. We are shortly heading to the polls to decide who should lead the nation. But on what basis will the people come to this to this decision? Because when in 2014 they did offer a mandate to this current ruling dispensation, they did so with the hope that the government would come through on its bloated rhetoric of sabka saat, sabka vikas, the illusory promise of inclusive development for all Indians. Now fast forward 10 years later, sir, and we find the people of this country have been sadly betrayed by a government whose economic mismanagement in this past decade has left the people of India staring at widespread distress, hardship, low incomes and high unemployment. The first glimpse of their economic ineptitude came with the reckless decision of demonetization that broke the back of the Indian economy and resulted in a monumental disaster where poor and middle class citizens suffered and in several cases even died while waiting in long lines to convert their notes while the wealthy friends of the government managed to exchange their currency with ease. We must also not forget the sudden no-notice lockdown of 24 March 2020, imposed without warning or planning, which led to lakhs of migrant workers walking, trudging thousands of miles, kilometers back to their homes. During that national lockdown, sir, the most stringent in the world between April and May 2020, individual income in India dropped by 40%. The bottom 10% of households lost three months' worth of income. Over its first two terms, this government demonstrated that its specialty was Dr. to issue Tharu. policies marked Dr. by Tharu. haste, incompetence, Dr. and Tharu. complete disregard just, for its own citizens. Just one minute. One minute. The House has taken up the discussion and voting on demand for grants on account for the year 24-25. Sri Suresh Kodinwani and Sri Mati Aparupa Podar have tabled cut motions on the demand for grants on account. If the honourable members want to move their cut motions, they may send a slip at the table within 15 minutes, indicating the serial number of the cut motions they would like to move. A list showing the serial numbers of cut motions treated as moved will be put up on the notice board shortly thereafter. In case the members find any discrepancy in the list, they may kindly bring it to the notice of the officer at the table immediately. Now proceed, Dr. Sir. I'll resume, sir, where I left off and welcome the finance minister to this house. If demonetization was a bad policy, badly implemented, GST was a good idea, badly designed and shabbily implemented. The goods and services tax has been used to trample over the financial autonomy of our states. And when coupled with demonetization, it resulted in finishing off India's job generating small, micro and medium businesses. It caused a 45 year unemployment high and ended the economic recovery that had begun in 2013, all while failing to achieve any of its stated objectives. Ordinary Indians have suffered, sir. Even the GST tax slabs on basic commodities like toothpaste, 5%, footwear, 18%, shirt and pants, 5%, rice and wheat, 5%. Instead of flushing our black money, it simply resulted in concentrating wealth in the hands of the government at the expense of the Aam Aadmi. Sir, so any talk of a robust economy and of GDP growth cannot be abstract or theoretical, but must be rooted and centered in the welfare of the people of India, who are the principal stakeholders of our economic progress. The question is, who are the people the government is serving? The finance minister mentioned four quote-unquote castes that the government supposedly looks after, namely the garib, poor, mahilai and women, yuva, youth, and anadata farmers. She said that their needs and aspirations and welfare are the government's highest priority. However, all four groups are some of the worst performing groups in the most categories you can find for social and economic policy performance. Let's begin with the Yuva. There is a tragic irony in the government's claims of success when desperate young people are queuing up to risk their lives in Israel in the middle of a war because they have no decent work in India. The unprecedented levels of unemployment have left countless citizens, especially our young workforce, with few prospects for a brighter tomorrow. Overall, an unemployment rate of 8 to 9 percent has become the new normal in our country. Unemployment reached a 45-year high in 2017, 
currently stands at 7.3% according to CMIE data, but has, been, has crossed 8% just a few months ago. Worse, the unemployment rate amongst youth aged 20 to 24 stood at 45.4%, sir, in 22 23. The Indian economy actually employs fewer people today than it employed in 2012. The two da the, the, the data we have actually for the government is only 2018 and 2012, but that's, that's where we have it. Uh, we employ fewer people. Agriculture and manufacturing jobs have gone down. Financially precarious construction work and low-end service roles are the only ones where they've seen any sort of employment. No wonder people are so prepared to risk their life and limb for a job in Israel, risking dying to make a living, sir. That's what our people, our young people have been reduced to. Periodic labor force survey data shows that regular salaried employment has stagnated for five years. Talk of self-employment, which the government does, is a cop-out because most of the self-employment is unpaid family labor, which is disguised unemployment. Experts reckon that the growing army of self-employed in any case constitutes very low quality uh, employment and unpaid workers have increased from 40 million in 2017 to 95 million last year. You can call them self-employed, but unpaid workers are not counted as employed by the ILO, the International Labor Organization. Now, the share of agriculture in total employment has gone up, which is an indication that there are not enough jobs available outside of agriculture. To this, the government offers schemes like Skill India as a palliative. Skill India has set out a goal of skilling 40 crore workers by 2022, but if you look at the total, the grand total trained under the Pradhan Mantri Kaushal Vikas Yojana, it is 1.3 crore, not 40 crore. And of that 1.3, only 24 lakh people have been placed in jobs. Skill India has been a failure, sir. The workforce share that was formerly vocationally educated trained in 2012 was 2.3%. In 2023, after 10 years of this government, the share has gone from 23 to 2.4%. What should we say? Congratulations. All this crying about Yuva Shakti. Huh? The truth is that their future looks bleak, sir. The finance minister doesn't wish to hear any uncomfortable truth, sir. This is pre planned, sir. This is pre planned. It is. The, the young people of our country sir, are facing a double whammy. Falling labor participation rates and shockingly high unemployment, as I've just described, while the minister was otherwise occupied. Government praises the startup culture as an alternative, but fund starved startups fired nearly 18,000 people in 2022. Startup fundraising activity is so subdued, sir, that in all Indian startups put together, raised just $1.1 billion in January, down 75% compared to January of the previous year. Let's turn to MSMEs. They've been the main employment generators in this country, but they also find themselves shrinking in today's economy. Many were permanently closed after the disastrous demonetization. In 2016, we had 6.25 crore MSMEs. The number has dwindled to now 3.25 crore, as per the government's own Udayam portal, the MSME registration portal. More than 60% of the conventional micro-enterprises in our country, which were engaged in business activities for more than 10 years, have perished. They've been closed, sir. So that's the picture we are seeing. What is the stage of employment generation? We have to ask the government, kiska saath or kiska vikas? The question, again, brings me to yet another aspect of the government's underperformance, woefully ignored in the Honorable Finance Minister's speech. She said people are living better and earning better. Average real income, she said, has increased by 50%. The first is no, no data available on individual household income. So how does the government say it's increased by 50%? If she's merely talking per capita GDP, sir, that is not a valid comparison, as per capita GDP would go up on the basis of people who are rich at the top of the pyramid without actually affecting the incomes of those at the bottom. If Mr. Adani and Mr. Ambani walked into this chamber right now, Every MP would discover that our per capita income has gone up, right? But the moment they leave this room, we would all revert to reality. That's the problem with using per capita as her guide. A critical appraisal reveals 
that technically some incomes have gone up on per capita basis, but if you're middle class, lower middle class or poor, your incomes have shrunk. That's the inequality in our country today. There's a Reuters survey this month, sir, say, stating that over 85% of the interviewed families reported stagnant or lower incomes compared to the years before the pandemic. Post-pandemic, the poorest 20% households in India saw income levels shrink 52% from their 2015 levels. And this is as per the latest India's Consumer Economic Survey. Compare this with the pre 2014 period that the finance minister put so much effort to discredit. During UPA 2, that 2009 to 14, real agriculture rural wages grew at 8.6%. In contrast, during NDA 1, growth of real farm wages decelerated to 3.3%, and under NDA 2, the annual growth rate of real rural wages has become negative, sir. Can you give the exact thing? Agricultural wages minus 0.6%, non-agricultural minus 1.4%. So rural India is suffering reduced income, sir. Overall, when you compare income growth by income group from 2016 to 2022 in India, the top 20% of the rich have seen almost a 40% rise in their income growth, while the bottom 60% of our population have all seen negative income growth. There's also been a sharp fall in household savings because real incomes have declined. So let's look at the Garib. I'm looking at each of these castes, quote unquote, that she mentioned. The government claims it made 25 crore people free from multidimensional poverty in the last 10 years. Now that claim has to be interrogated. First, if 25 crore have indeed been freed from poverty, why are 81 crore still receiving free food grains? Second, how is the government expecting us to trust their number when consumption expenditure surveys were not done from 2014 onwards to 2022 and the National Multidimensional Poverty Index has been attacked by experts here and abroad who question both the manner and methodology with which it is calculated. The truth is the government's record is disillusioning. The UPA era created the fastest, fastest ever decline of poverty levels in India's history between 2005 and 15. When I, 271 million or 27.1 crore Indians were lifted out of poverty, providing what UNDP called the greatest relative development for the poorest 40% during this period. Under the BJP, I'm still quoting international sources, 230 million Indians or 23 crore slipped into poverty during the pandemic. And according to the World Bank, an astounding 80% of the world's people who slipped into poverty in 2020 during the pandemic were from India. 80% going below the poverty line were from India. But there's worse. The National Survey Organization has not conducted its quinquennial uh, national consumption expenditure surveys to identify the proportion of people below the poverty line. The global poverty line at one point was $1 a day, now it's $2, according to World Bank and UN figures. But in India, despite all the government's tall claims of growth, the official national poverty line is very low, at Rs. 1,286 per month per person in urban areas and 1,059 per month per person in rural areas. Has the government raised 25 crore people above these levels? There's no indication. The Indian government has conducted no survey. Neither a national consumption expenditure survey and, of course, no national census either. We are in a statistical void. And what we only have is this multidimensional poverty index of the Niti Aayog, which is a new index they have created, which cannot be compared with any past poverty numbers. We have absolutely no basis for judging whether poverty has actually gone down, as the finance minister claims. As we all know, on issue after issue, NDA apparently stands for no data available. <laughs> So one of the greatest disservices that this government has done to India is that a country which enjoyed a global reputation for reliable statistics is no longer trusted on its numbers. From COVID death claims to real life economic indicators. These are really horribly disenchanting figures that seek to mask but in fact reveal the government's mismanagement of our economy. The finance minister calls inflation moderate. But the fact is, he's not acknowledging that the Indian middle class and poor have been left defenseless in the face of rising inflation. Retail inflation measured by the CPI rose to a 15-month high of 7.44% in July 2023. But a recent survey by the data analytics firm uh, Kantar 
found that 57% of Indians are worried about rising inflation. Look at wholesale market prices from December 2023, just a month ago. 19.6% higher when compared with the same month the previous year. Paddy became costlier by 10.5%, milk by 7%, vegetables by 26.3% year on year. And this is linked to growing nutritional concerns. The state of food security and nutrition in the world report, another unimpeachable international document, says that a significant 74.1% of India's population cannot afford healthy food. This translates to over 100 crore people in India facing a crisis of inadequate nutrition. And it's a distressing number that is substantiated by our dropping to the 111th rank out of 125 countries in the 2023 Global Hunger Index. Even in the latest interim budget speech, the finance minister spent a lot of time celebrating the success of GST, amassing a lot of revenues. But her speech was not punctuated this year with any verses or shairies, not even from Tiruvallavar. So I, I prompted a poet friend of mine to put the plight of the suffering it caused the Aam Admi into verse. And I'd like to share it with her to italicize the really sad state of the Indian economy from the, uh, from the, the point of view of a, of a common man like this Kavi. Karz ke bodh se aam admi tar tar ho gaya, mehenga ho gaya khana peena, mehenga ghar ho gaya. Mantri ji ke budget ki khami hum batlate hain, sir se kar ke shuru, chalo pero tak jate hain. Kuch chuninda yaaron, kuch chuninda yaaron ke bade bangle ho gaye, baalon se pero tak aate hum kangle ho gaye. Maana aap dai nahi karte, par kahi to karte hain. Itni mehengi ho gai dai ki lagane se darte hain. Kashme ke damo ko sun, aankhe ro gai. Kam lagao toothpaste, paste bhi mehengi ho gai. Baal katane se bhi hum ab katne lag gai. Bina cream ke haak pae bhi phatne lag gai. Phat gai kameez ki collar par nahi to nahi le nahi sakte. GST itna zyada hai hum de nahi sakte. पूछ रहा था कोई हम वजन कैसे घटाते हैं जब से सब्जियां के दाम बढ़े हम कम से खाते हैं दिखा के लॉलीपॉप वो भरमा कर चले गए इस बार भी इस बार भी वो अपने ही गुण गा कर चले गए कैसे सोच लिया कि जनता फिर से माफ करेगी कैसे सोच लिया कि जनता फिर से माफ करेगी इस बार चुनावों से चुनावों में जनता जड़ से साफ करेगी दैट्स हर इज द प्लाइट ऑफ द आम आदमी अदर्स हु कैन आर वोटिंग विद देयर फीट द एक्सटर्नल अफेयर्स मिनिस्टर टोल्ड पार्लियामेंट दैट ओवर 16 लाख इंडियंस गिव अप देयर सिटीजनशिप इंक्लूडिंग 2 लाख 25000 इन 2022 अलोन high net worth indians are leaving the country because of this government's tax terrorism 7500 millionaires left india in 2022 6500 last year they have taken their resources to invest them abroad and not in our country where private investment is seriously down under the nda government the fm's claims of uh, human development don't stand the test of objective scrutiny either she claimed that a large number of new institutions of higher learning, especially AIMS, IITs, IMs, are being set up. As I've said in the House innumerable times, the problem with this government is not ideation. It's the delivery of public services and the implementation of grand policy announcements. In this case, too, the government has failed to ensure proper execution. Look at the AIMS, for example. In some cases, only land is allotted. Nothing is done beyond that. Sometimes even that clearance takes years. In Madurai, the approval to construct an AIMS came five years after the PM laid the foundation stone in 2019. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In my own state of Kerala, we are still waiting for the establishment of an AIMS to boast the quality of medical services for our residents. In other cases like AIMS, Bhubaneswar, posts are lying vacant and nothing has been operationalized. Now, another major axis of the government's self-congratulation was the efficacy of its various schemes for the poor. They're very nicely named and so on. But that too is a delusion that requires a sobering reality check. 
In the last fiscal year for which we have numbers, 90 lakh beneficiaries of the government's flagship Pradhan Mantri Ujwala Yojana did not refill their cylinders. Data revealed through an RTI showed that of the 9.58 crore PM Ujwala Yojana households, 1.8 crore brought no refills, while another 1.51 crore bought just one refill. But the government does nothing to make the cylinders more affordable to ordinary people. It's all headline management, bottom line mismanagement. In fact, most of the government's success is actually let down. Jandhan, 51 crore Jandhan accounts were created, but over 20% of them are inoperative as of December 23, last month, uh, just a month ago. Nearly half the inoperative accounts belong to women. So much for Nari Shakti. Aishwan Bharat, in August 2023, the CAG found that 43,000 crore had been misappropriated in the Aishwan Bharat scheme. Munrega, which the Prime Minister had disparaged in his first looks of our speech of 2020 or 2014. Demand for Munrega continues to be higher even than pre-COVID levels, despite the low wages being given and the various bottlenecks in accessing the scheme. Between April and December 2023, just the last six-month phrase, a record 231.34 crore person days were generated across all states at a time when the government had drastically reduced the budget for the scheme by 33% in the last budget. They then had to seek supplementary funds of 16,000 crore in December. If the economy is so good, if jobs are so plentiful, why did the revised estimate for Manrega 2023-24 increase by 43% compared to the budget estimate? Let's turn to the Anadatta. Close to 689 lakh farmers enrolled under the Fasal Bhima Yojana during the 2023 season. Claims were only paid to 7.8 lakh farmers. Damn. Are you supporting your applicants or not? The number of beneficiaries enrolled under the PM Kisan Samman Nidhi Yojana decreased from 11.84 crores in 2019 to 3.78 crores Five. in 22, marking a 67% decline, sir. And CAG tells us over 3,000 crores were reportedly siphoned away from the PM Kisan scheme through the creation of fake beneficiaries using publicly available Aadhaar details. In fact, the total expenditure to the Ministry of Agriculture and schemes related to farmers' welfare has been declining as a percentage of the total budget outlay since 2019. And during these, this government's period from 2014 to 2022, at least one lakh farmers have committed suicide. As per recently released National Crime Records Bureau report, this amounts to a scary 30 suicides per day every day that BJP has been in power sir, in the last nine years. The Prime Minister's promise to double the income of farmers between 2015 and 2022 lies in shambles. They've stopped repeating it. The headlines were made at one time, now they've not been repeating it or fulfilling it, sir. The issue has disappeared completely from policy making, while the real incomes of agricultural households from cultivation has fallen, as I said, by 1.4%. Now, the finance minister also made a big deal about the blue revolution in the fishery sector, a sector where the government actually doesn't have much to boast about. I can tell you because most of the fishermen in my constituency are living below the poverty line, and the budget allocation for the sector has been raised for the entire country by a meager 134 crore, the government claims to have doubled pisciculture and aquaculture, absolutely no evidence of this. And the PM himself talked about creating a ministry of fisheries, but they've only created a department of fisheries, which is part of a larger ministry. I've never heard of a government that actually breaks its own promise and then claims credit for it. They have promised a ministry for two successive elections. They have never given a full ministry to the fisher folk and our coastal region. The rhetoric surrounding Nari Shakti for the Mahila also uh, requires additional debunking to what I've already said earlier. While we in the opposition welcome the women's reservation law, we are deeply skeptical about the vague timeline of the government, but equally representation is not enough in isolation. We know that grand announcements alone don't help women. We need policies that will help them get the resources they need. Consider, for example, the integrated child development services. You've rebranded it, of course, uh, your Phraseology is always great, Saksha Manganwadi and Potion 2.0. But your budget for integrated child development has actually declined, even while new labels are coming. We have gone, uh, in the course of the, of the, of the, of the Modi government's uh, existence, to reduce money available for child development. 
Similarly, while the government's claims of, of an increase in the number of women participating in the labor force tries to paint a positive picture, the truth is that the rise has only been post-pandemic because women had dropped out of the force during the pandemic <coughs> in very large numbers. And women are doing tedious, low-paid or unemployed work. I beg your pardon, unpaid work, which is technically unemployment uh, in this country. India ranks 127 out of 146 countries in the Global Gender Gap Index 2023, a searing indictment of our inability to provide the space that our women need to survive and thrive in the labor force. So much then for all the claims of empowering the Garib, the Mahilaya, the Yuva, the Annadatta. Contextualizing the FM's budget speech in the highly competitive global environment yields even more evidence of policy failure. Dr. Tharoor, the finance minister argued Dr. that Dr. India's Tharoor, economic already, development has been good even... I'm sorry? You have already completed 25 minutes. Five minutes more, sir. I, I'll quickly, I'll quickly wrap the up. Party has the finance minister has argued that India's economic development has been good even as GDP growth averages a modest uh, rate uh, post-COVID. Um, our post-COVID growth has actually been lower even than Bangladesh, Vietnam, and even until very recently China. So what worries me more is the, gross, uh, is the sharp uptick in the gross debt-to-GDP ratio, which has invited concerns from the IMF that I hope the minister will address. The government has also missed its disinvestment target for the fifth year in a row. I'm just summarizing my last few points for you, sir. Uh, the trend of rising governmental debts in the last 10-year period has been very worrying because high debt unemployed by low, accompanied by low employment and high food inflation is the worst possible scenario for our country, for the ordinary people of our country, and for any emerging market to attract investments. Fiscal deficit averaged 4.63% uh, under um, our UPA government. It's averaging 5.13% under the NDA. Uh, I'm not going to go into details about that because fiscal deficit is not at the moment our biggest concern. But since the finance minister talked about it and FDI inflows uh, doubling and so on by comparison with UPA, I just want to say it's a blatantly misleading assertion because FDI inflow as a ratio of GDP peaked in 2007-8 at around 3.6% and has never regained that level. Net FDI to GDP ratio today is only 1%. And the fact is that um, hardly any greenfield investment money has come in. RBI estimates that foreign investment today stands at $42 billion in 22-23, which is about the same as in 2008, 2009, 15 years ago under UPA. Over those 15 years, foreign investment has come down in terms of a percentage of GDP, whereas Vietnam, for example, has close to 4.5% of GDP in their example. And gross FDI into... Uh, into India in the first half of the current financial year, April to September, was just $10 billion. The last time it was lower than this was in the first half of 2007-2008, sir. And the finance minister hasn't given us any cost-benefit analysis of the production-linked incentive scheme for which so much money has been spent. Where is the employment generation happening, Madam Minister? There is an absolute need for mid-course corrections, and she will have to answer this question. Internally, meanwhile, sir, our states are in turmoil because transfers to states have been reduced substantially. We know right now in Jantar Manta there's a protest going on with many states protesting the way in which uh, amounts have not been transferred. Um, the current allocation of 3,67,000 crores in budget 22-23 already sees a gap of almost 6,000 crores in the revised estimates. And there's been a further uh, decrease in the coming budget to 3,59,000 crores. Devolution of tax revenues is a problem because the states have only been getting 30 to 33 percent in the last five years, a far cry from the 15th Finance Commission's recommendation of 41 percent and a reduction from the 42 percent given by the 14th Finance Commission. And the fact is the share of cesses and surcharges, which the government doesn't need to share with the states, keeps going up. It's now, um, it was 8.16 percent of gross tax revenue under our peak. But under this government, it, the number has tripled to 28.08% of gross tax revenue in the last fiscal year. So I just want to say there's a rising trend in, in, in CapEx, and we all have applauded that in the past. But the fact is the government seems to believe in trickle-down economics. Spend money at the top, somebody will benefit down below. We believe in trickle-up, sir. That is, if our economy produces the things that people wish to consume at affordable prices, the Aam Aadmi will not only live better, but will become a full participant in the economy. 
our objective should be to make ordinary people into consumers and stakeholders in India's economic prosperity, but our government does not see them at all in just focusing on capex. Finally, sir, the finance minister reserving an amount of 111,111 ,111 crores for capital expenditure shows there's nothing particularly scientific about the calculations in our budget. A minister who chooses a lucky number is heading an economy that needs all the luck it can get, sir. There is no question that when she says that GDP stands for governance, development and performance, GDP, as I've pointed out through my speech, the fact is it's not equitably enhancing the capabilities of the ordinary people of this country. Instead, G stands for government intrusion and tax terrorism, D stands for demographic betrayal, and P stands for poverty continuing. This actual GDP also jettisons the trinity of demography, democracy, and diversity the government claims to be serving. The demographic dividend is on the cusp of becoming a demographic disaster with the unemployment crisis, the K-shaped growth, and the ever-widening schism between the rich and the poor. Democracy is suffering through this government's arrogant contempt for institutions, a government that suspended 146 MPs rather than be held accountable for a security breach that bulldozes laws as per its own whims and fancies with no regard for parliamentary yeah. procedure, that requires a no-confidence motion to be moved before its, issues, before its leaders are willing to speak on Manipur. vital issues, including Manipur, yeah. should ideally refrain from claiming to be the messiah of democracy, let alone its mother. And when it comes to diversity, we know the record hasn't been great either, with increase, increasing attacks on religious minorities, the ruthless dispensing of bulldozer justice, mob lynching, communal violence, and worse, combined with the disregard for states and their operations through a skewed and, and centralizing uh, cooperative federalism under which the states are meant to cooperate, but the center operates as it pleases. The government has failed gravely on all the counts where it pats its own Thank back. You. Therefore, you. sir, I'm concluding, this House must realize the game of smoke and mirrors that the government is playing with interim budget, with nearly no redressal of the real crises plaguing our economy and affecting the armed army. It is high time that this election gives others an opportunity to show up their shallow rhetoric for what it is, which is all talk and no action. Thank, thank you, you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Yes. I should thank you, Dr. Tharoor.